Welcome to the webinar, Getting Babies Ready for Discharge, the Car Seat Tolerance Screen. This presentation is sponsored by the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems and is part of the Child Passenger Safety and Occupant Protection Healthcare Project, which is a grant that is funded from the Maryland Motor Vehicle Administration's Highway Safety Office. I'm Suzanne Ogaitis Jones, and I coordinate this project. Our presenter today is Dr. Natalie Davis. Dr. Davis is the Associate Professor at the Department of Pediatrics and the Division of Neonatology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dr. Davis has been providing hospitals with research and guidance on child passenger safety and the car seat tolerance screen for a number of years. And we've been especially fortunate in Maryland to have her expertise, as she is also a nationally recognized expert on this test. Way back in 2015, she first helped us write some recommendations for the car seat tolerance test for Maryland hospitals. Then a couple years after that, she presented on the test at our first workshop for newborn and NICU nurses and also recorded her lecture so that many others could listen and maybe you have heard that lecture. Um, what most don't know about Dr. Davis is that throughout all that time and continuing now, she has been a wonderful resource behind the scenes, always willing to answer any questions that come up um, within the Maryland medical community or the CPS community about car seats and the car seat tolerance screen. We are delighted to have Dr. Davis provide an update today on the car seat tolerance screen with this lecture. Dr. Davis? Uh, thank you so much, Suzanne, for that wonderful introduction. And I'm very excited to be here presenting to this fantastic group of people to talk a little bit more about the work that I'm passionate about, which is getting babies ready for discharge, the car seat tolerance screen. So with that, I have no conflicts of interest or financial relationships to disclose, but occasionally my coworkers do make me sit through faculty meetings in car seats because they think it's funny. So today I'm gonna to talk through kind of the who, what, where, why, when, and hows of car seat tolerance screening to try to get a really nice background for everyone here. So you know the background of the history of the car seat tolerance screen, current recommendations for who should be tested, what failure guidelines should be used, what to do when a baby fails, where future research is focusing, and really how we counsel families when it comes to car seat tolerance screening. To take a step back, um, I think all of us probably have as many different names as are up on this screen for this type of test. And none of them are wrong, but we'll, we'll kind of use them interchangeably. So car seat testing, challenges, angle tolerance test, um, ultimately, in the literature, you'll see it published as the car seat tolerance screen more recently. Um, but again, these are all very similar tests to assess safety in the semi upright position for neonates. So, to start out, I think it's really important that people are going through this educational training to really improve the care we provide to babies. Uh, there was a recent survey that actually Suzanne pointed out to me that was um, public or that is unpublished data but is listed in the nan.org website. Um, a survey done by a number of people in 2020 on nursing knowledge and provision of child passenger safety information um, for neonatal nurses. And this group surveyed a lot of neonatal nurses. The majority who responded were NICU nurses who had a lot of NICU experience, so greater than or equal to 20 years. So kind of a skewed group of experience. But even in that group, only 38% of the nurses were identified as having high level child passenger safety knowledge when quiz on best practices um, provided by the American Academy of Pediatrics, or AAP, and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA. And there was a low number of kind of less experienced nurses with high level CPS knowledge. So it's really concerning. And why is that? Well, this group also pointed out that ongoing CPS training or CPST tech certification was required by the respondents employers only 18% of the time. That almost half of nurses self-reported a lack of understanding and awareness of CPS best practice recommendations, and this is in NICU nurses. And despite the fact that over half, the almost half of people felt they had a lack of understanding, over 80% of nurses noticed they had provided verbal education and answered families' child passenger safety questions in the past six months, and almost everyone regularly conducted car seat tolerance screening. So that's really concerning. So people want to do their best, but they don't have the um, education and the knowledge to really provide this best practice, which is why this information and these modules are so important. 
And a separate poll taken during um, a webinar from Lifesavers in 2016 found that 73% of nurses had never had a tech or child passenger safety teacher. So it's really important to, to know the basis while you're moving forward so you can best take care of your patients. So starting out with why, why do we do this test or what's the history of the CAR-C tolerance screen? So really this started um, early on, but really in the 1970s, data came out from NHTSA that demonstrated that infants properly restrained in a car safety seat during a motor vehicle crash had an over 70% reduction in death. So obviously this is a no brainer. Infants and children should travel in car safety seats. And since the 1970s, the AAP has recommended infants travel in an appropriate car safety seat. However, with improvements in neonatal care, we were starting to save babies who were smaller and more preterm. And how do they go home? They go home in car seats. So they started noticing that preterm infants were at increased risk of desaturations while in that semi-upright car seat position. So a few studies came out that looked at this and speculated, is this due to immature lungs? Is this due to breathing immaturity, apnea of prematurity? Is this due to poor tone and poor strength that's commonly seen in preterm infants? Or were they too small for their standard seats? Um, standard seats were often made for five pound car children. And we know a lot of NICU babies are under five pounds or five pounds, but very small. So did they just not fit in the standard seat? So because of this data, since the early 1990s, the AAP has recommended a period of observation for apnea, bradycardia, and desaturations while in the car seat prior to discharge for preterm infants, which we now call the car seat tolerance screen. <clears throat> In the 2000s, this began um, to be studied a little bit more, um, and evidence came out that the longer the time in the car seat, the increased the risk of these desaturation events. So this information led to what the AAP currently recommends from 20, 2009 and reaffirmed in 2013, that recommend testing all infants born less than 37 weeks or premature for 90 to 120 minutes or duration of the car ride home, whichever is longer. But there were no specific guidelines for failure that were given. And this surprises a lot of people. Everyone seems to think, and my, myself included, when I first started this research was that what my hospital does is what the AAP recommends. But I quickly realized that the AAP doesn't give specific recommendations for vital signs that constitute a failure. So it's kind of left up to us, each individual institution, to determine what guidelines constitute a failure and what you do next if a baby fails the CAR-C tolerance screen. So what the um, specific safe transportation um, uh, document says from um, pediatrics is that the increased frequency of desaturation um, episodes of apnea and bradycardia while in the car seat suggests that preterm infants should undergo this period of observation before they go home. A period of observation should last a minimum of 90 to 120 minutes or duration of the travel um, home, whichever is longer. And that hospitals really should develop protocols to include car safety seat observation before discharge for preterm infants. They then go on to say some hospital protocols include observations for infants at risk other than those who are premature. And examples they give include those with hypotonia or low tone, such as those with trisomy 21 or congenital neuromuscular disorders, those with micronathia or airway anomalies, and those who've undergone congenital heart surgery. But you can see here, they don't specifically recommend testing low birth weight, hypotonia, cardiac issues, and they don't give a specific recommendation for failure criteria. So kind of what's missing? So clearly what's missing, no specific guidelines for what constitutes a failure. And that's really challenging because we still struggle to this day to identify what's a safe lower saturation for a baby to go home, um, what's a safe lower saturation before we start some intervention. So we struggle with that in the NICU and in the newborn nursery, um, let alone at the time of discharge for CAR-C tolerance screening. And really what else is missing is consensus on other groups to test. I know all of us have um, different policies where we test different babies. So what's the information that's out there? What can we come to a consensus about who it's important to test? And finally, what do we do when an infant fails this test? So what are the next recommendations? And what does a failed car seat tolerance screen really mean for the health and the safety of that baby? And how important is this topic? How impactful is this? Well, just some local statistics. So prematurity is defined as less than 37 weeks gestation. In the US, about 9.8% give or take of babies are born prematurely each year, which is about a half a million babies a year. Um, Maryland stats relatively recently were about 10%, and Baltimore City, where I work, is 13%. So we have a really high rate of prematurity. So that's a lot of our patients that we're recommending CAR-C tolerance screening on, let alone those who are low birth weight, let alone those with heart issues, let alone those with airway issues. And so what 
comes up a lot of times in the NICU is sort of the battle between child passenger safety and the neonatologist. And so it's important to know kind of where the neonatal team is coming from. And so therefore you can really intelligently discuss this issue with them. So we all know advances in medical technology and neonatal care has led to sicker and smaller babies surviving to discharge. And it could potentially be 10% or more of our patients. <clears throat> and that babies are going home at smaller weights and lower corrective gestation ranges. However, car seats have not historically been designed with medically complex infants in mind. And really newborn medicine and child passenger safety are two extremely important evolving fields that don't communicate well. Um, newborn medicine is focused on getting babies safe, getting babies to the point of discharge and getting them home. We kind of drop off after that. Once they leave the door, they kind of don't exist in our world anymore in the NICU and newborn nursery. Um, child passenger safety team is there to not only make sure that the babies you know, get to the point of going home safely, but that they actually get home safely and continue to travel safely. So I think it's important to be able to bridge that gap and have a knowledge of both, which is what you're all doing, which is amazing. So kind of taking a step back, the AAP has historically said that preterm infants would be ready to be discharged after achieving a defined weight, maybe five pounds or so. But with more research, we found that actually they can be discharged earlier safely if we use physiologic criteria rather than weight. And the way we define them being physiologically stable is you know, eating enough to grow, staying warm in the crib in their home environment. Those two things are easy to define. What's really complex to define is what, what constitutes mature respiratory control. How do we say that they're breathing safely and ready to go home? And so what the AAP and the Committee on Fetus and Newborn know is that infants are not safe for hospital discharge until physiologically mature and stable cardiorespiratory function has been documented for a sufficient duration. And we've all seen this. If babies aren't breathing safely, they're not ready to go home. The argument for the car seat tolerance screen is this must apply not only while supine in the crib, but also while semi upright in the car seat. They're gonna be traveling in this position. So it really is important that we document that they're safe in that position as well. So that takes us to what? What failure guidelines should be used? Um, we don't have, you know, kind of still working on the literature, still working on the specifics, but most recently um, my group did a national survey of NICUs. Uh, we looked at approximately 200 NICUs representing the entire nation um, with level two, three, and four NICUs represented. And we had them categorize their CARSI testing policies based on things such as inclusion criteria for testing, duration of the test, two of those things have specific AAP recommendations as we went over, but what we really wanted to focus on is failure criteria and definitions. So we don't have specific recommendations, but what are the NICUs across the nation actually doing? Can we use that to, to further our information? So we asked them about what constitutes a failure from an oxygen desaturation, as well as a bradycardia or low heart rate. <clears throat> and what we found is quite a wide variation. So you can see in this um, graph from the paper, the x-axis represents the saturation that constituted a failure. So it ranged from less than 80% to less than 92%, so quite a wide variation. And the y-axis gives us the percentage of NICUs that responded with that number. And then the pattern gives us the duration of time that they had to fall below that level to constitute a failure. And you can see 90% was the most common, but still it was about 50% of responses. So there are about 50% of NICUs across the nation that use something different. So we haven't come to a full consensus. And why this is a problem is because we're treating our babies different, not based on the baby, but based on what hospital they're discharged from. So here's an example. So this baby here, during their car seat tolerance screen, dropped to 86% for 25 seconds. At this block of institutions, that baby would fail their car seat tolerance screen because they dropped below 90% for longer than 20 seconds. At this block of institutions, that baby would pass their car seat tolerance screen because they had to drop below 85% for longer than 30 seconds. So you can see this is really problematic and one of the biggest criticisms of the test is we're treating the baby differently, not based on changes in the baby, but based on different um, failure criteria at different institutions. So this is why it's really important that we all kind of get on the same page. When it came to bradycardia or heart rate, we actually have a much stronger consensus. So you can see, again, along the x-axis, the, the numbers, which range from less than 70 to less than 100 or certain percentage changes from baseline. But the vast majority of institutions, over 70%, use less than 80. But what you can also see is we, again, have a really wide variation in duration. It ranged from any to longer than 30 seconds to constitute a failure. <clears throat> 
So what are the suggested failure criteria? So this is not specific from the AAP, but this is from the data out there on a survey of NICUs, as well as a survey I did with um, uh, Ben Hoffman from OHSU and Eric Eichenwald from CHOP, looking at newborn nurseries. So what we currently recommend based on consensus is failure criteria of heart rate less than 80 beats per minute for greater than 10 to 20 seconds, oxygen saturation less than 90% for greater than 10 to 20 seconds. My institution uses 10 seconds, but I, my suspicion is we're going to potentially recommend 20 seconds, but some sort of range, so it's not just any drop below that. It has to be more sustained to prove that it's real. Um, or respiratory distress not improved with proper positioning. For those units that take care of cyanotic heart disease babies, we rec are gonna recommend um, a, a drop more than 10% from their baseline. So if their baseline saturation is 85%, if they drop below 75%, we would con consider that a failure. It's important to note that the pediatric Canadian, uh, Canadian Pediatric Society used to recommend routine car seat tolerance screening, but since 2016 no longer recommends it routinely because they argue there isn't great data on outcomes. And that is true. Um, it, currently in the US, we're think, we think it's widely implemented. We know a certain percentage of kids fail. Let's, let's all get on the same page. Let's study it. Let's get more information before we just stop it. Um, the Canadian Pediatric Society just decided to stop it. So different ways to approach this, but I think it's really important that this test is evaluated further so we can see which kids are going to benefit, which kids aren't, and we can really make a, a scientific decision. So who? Who should be tested? Um, easier said than done. So what's, who should we test? I think it's important to look, what's at the data? What's out there? What do we know? So this is a number of um, different categories of patients, our preterm, our low birth weight, our cardiac patients, those with low tone, airway anomalies, oxygen requirement. These are all um, kids that we're often testing. So what do we know about them? What about preterm infants? So the studies that are out there um, aren't a lot, but there's more and more growing data. So um, keep your eyes peeled. But we, my group looked at a, um, uh, about 1,000 infants from um, either the nursery or NICU that were born prematurely. We didn't exclude anyone from any other medical comorbidities. They were included if they were preterm. <clears throat> and what we found in a study that came out in 2013 was about 4% of the kids failed. And interestingly, we went into this speculating that it would be the micropremies, the early preterm infants that failed, those kids with really bad lungs. But what we found was those kids who failed actually tended to be less premature. They had larger birth weights but they were chronologically younger at the time of testing. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is the kids who failed tended to be late preterm kids. They tended to be those kids that were admitted to the nursery or briefly spent time in the NICU and then were in the nursery, but were tested at kind of two to three days of age. So that 36 weeker vaginal delivery who went to the nursery, who was tested just due to prematurity at about two days of life before mom was discharged. Those tended to be the kids that were more likely to fail. And so the overall incidence was about 4.3%, but we found in those micropremies, those early preterm infants less than 34 weeks, about 2.5% failed, as opposed to those late preterm 34 to 36 weeks, a lot of those kids are in the nursery, over double that group failed. So 5.6% of that group failed. And although 60% of our study population were late preterm, this group accounted for almost 80% of the kids who failed. And almost two thirds of failures came from the nursery. So these were kids that were in the nursery getting excellent care, being evaluated by nurses, nurse practitioners, doctors, and, and deemed to be safe to be in the nursery, who then were tested only because of prematurity and found to fail. Um, and a third of those kids who failed actually required admission to the NICU for persistent vital sign abnormalities. So these late preterm kids are still immature and, um, and we really need to keep a close eye on them. So why might a healthy, you know, late preterm infant who's otherwise in the nursery getting good care be more likely to fail? Well, one idea is that it's based on chronologic age and level of maturity. So we know kind of intermittent oxygen drops are a function of maturity. So the kind of longer since birth, the less likely these are to happen. Um, and a lot of these late preterm kids who are in the nursery are tested at kind of two to four days of age, as opposed to the early preterm kids who are often weeks old at the time of testing. So it could be that this level of chronologic age plays a role. In addition, it could be timing and duration of the monitoring. So early preterm kids are in the NICU, they're on continuous monitoring. Those late preterm kids in the nursery are being examined and appropriately cared for, but they're not on a monitor all the time. So we're not catching all of their 
desaturation events. So this could be that these infants are identified just because they're on a pulse ox during their CAR-C tolerance screen, not necessarily due to respiratory distress. So a lot of potential reasons. <clears throat> a more recent study that came out um, looking at preterm infants um, that just came out in 2021 by Dr. Hoffman from Oregon Health Science um, kind of recreated this and looked at about a thousand preterm infants and actually found a higher failure rate. They found 9% failed their CAR-C tolerance screen. And their definition at the time was less than 88% for longer than 20 seconds. So a more conservative definition than a lot of us have. 82% were retested and ultimately passed their um, the, in their original car seat, but 18% continued to fail and ultimately were discharged home in a car bed. And what was really impressive was almost half of them that didn't fail experienced some sort of cardiorespiratory instability. So that was defined as not quite a fail, like a near fail. So they might have dropped below 88% for 10 to 20 seconds. So not quite enough to fail, but still concerning. So it's really important to note that kids are, do not breathe effectively in the car seat. So it really emphasizes the need to educate families to minimize time in this position. So what's the data on low birth weight term kids? Um, about half of NICUs do include low birth weight term kids in their testing policy, although it's not specifically recommended by the AAP, it's kind of hinted at. So what's the data that's out there? So um, my group did a study in Baltimore that looked at a number of full-term low birth weight kids and found about a 5% incidence of failure in this study that came out in 2015. And what we found was 80% failed due to desaturations and 22% failed due to bradycardia. And this is one of the first studies that looked a little bit longer term to say, hey, what happened to these kids after they failed? Not just do they, repeat, do they pass, do they fail, but sort of what were they diagnosed with? And although it wasn't common, we ended up finding two kids who were diagnosed with a syndrome because they failed their car seat test. So the car seat test, you know, they would have come to medical care eventually, but because of their respiratory instability on the car seat test, they got a further workup and were identified to have a medical issue. And a lot of these kids were noted to pass after blanket rolls were added for stability and strap adjustments. This study came out in 2015, so it was much earlier than kind of modern times, but it showed that a lot of these kids, even that passed, didn't fit well in their car seat. So what about cardiac patients? A number of us take care of pre-op, sometimes post-op cardiac patients of a variety of different diagnoses. What's the data that's out there? Um, one study that came out in 2008, so you can see quite, quite, a, quite an old study, looked at 66 post-op babies with a variety of different heart lesions. So the two, very few were preterms, only two, and neither of those kids failed. But they did find about 6% of kids who were term failed this test. And unfortunately, they weren't able to identify any relationship between the type of surgery, how long they were in an event, their age, et cetera, and no neurologic issues that specifically predicted who failed. So we saw that these kids are failing, but we don't exactly know why or how to predict who. More recently, one of my NICU fellows, Dr. Emily Sangelo, and I um, did a study that we're presenting at a conference, the Eastern Society of Pediatric Research this March and PAS this April, and hopefully more to come, where we did a medical record review over five years looking at kids with critical and cyanotic heart lesions admitted to the University of Maryland who were either in the NICU, PICU, or newborn nursery at our hospital. And we identified the incidence and risk factors for failure in this population. <clears throat> so still preliminary data, we had about 53 babies with some form of critical congenital heart disease um, that met inclusion criteria. And we found about 9.4% of them failed. Um, every infant who failed did ultimately pass a repeat test. We looked at neurologic issues because we suspected this might come into play to see if um, kids with worst, worst brain issues were more likely to fail. And what we found was those with seizures, those with low tone, or those with white matter brain injury or periventricular leukomalacia were more likely to fail their CAR-C tolerance screen. And we then looked at it by diagnosis. So it's tough, we're still in the, in the process of looking at this, but we looked at a variety of different diagnoses and looked at how many kids had each cardiac diagnosis and what percent fail. So it's interesting, we found aortic, those with aortic stenosis, half of them failed, although the total number that we looked at was two. So again, um, a, small, a small number in the study. Um, TAPVR, or total anomalous pulmonary venous return, about a third failed. So some decent numbers of kids who are failing with these cyanotic lesions. But ultimately what we found was the incidence of failure in those kids that we had data 
there were some that had 0% failure, but there was a quite a bit, a range of 11% up to 50% failure rates. So still to come, but we were finding a substantial number of these kids and 9% overall with congenital heart disease, most were cyanotic, some were not, um, were failing their CAR-C tolerance screen. So we're hoping to get more data out and get this published. So what about those kids with low tone, airway anomalies, oxygen requirements? These are all kids we're kind of scared of. Some places test if a baby's been on CPAP. You know, what are we supposed to do? What's the data? Unfortunately, there's very limited data. So these are important aspects of future research, but we don't have great studies on them right now. Um, what we do have is a study I did with two of my medical students that we presented um, that looked at kids who weren't preterm or low birth weight. So kind of others, the vast majority of kids, term kids who are greater than 2.5 kilos. So first we wanted to know who of these are we testing and then who of those kids are failing. So who of these kind of other are we testing? Um, we looked at a study of about 2,500 babies, found that 5% of the, this other group were being tested. We found they were more likely to be tested if they were ever in the NICU, if they had breathing issues, needed resuscitation in the delivery room, were ever on a vent, um, if they had neurologic issues, if they had brain bleeds or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, or if they were small for their gestational age. So that makes sense. People are testing kind of off the books kids because they have breathing issues or brain issues or are small. And what we found of, of those groups, those kind of others, we found that about five and a half percent failed. And they were more likely to fail if they were small for their gestational age, so may not have fit as well in the car seat. They were more likely to fail if they had a lower weight at the time of car seat. And there was a trend that those who failed were more likely to have been in the nursery as opposed to the NICU, which, which again makes sense. More of these kids are gonna be in the nursery. So again, more to come, we're still trying to tease out this data a little bit and look at um, additional diagnoses, looking at ages, really focusing on cardiac and low tone kids. But at least we're seeing a, a decent number of kids who otherwise seem healthy are failing this test and having unstable breathing. So when, what to do when a baby fails? What are we supposed to do? And I think that's the ultimate question that comes up. It's important to take a step back and think why they fail. So it's likely multifactorial and it may be very different in every baby. So it could be due to lung immaturity or lung inflammation in those little small preterm infants. They don't have a lot of reserve, their lungs are small. It could be due to tone and strength. You know, we've all seen these babies are floppy, they're easily malpositioned, and they're too weak to correct their neck flexion at first. The straps could also, especially if they're not properly positioned, compress the chest. It could be small size, they have poor fit in the car seat, and like we notice, it's easy for them to flex their neck and include their airway and their straps could hit them improperly. Or it could be neurologic immaturity and increased risk of apnea but they have a poor response to low oxygen saturations, especially with sleep. It could be all, any one, sort of a multifactorial um, reasons in these babies. One of the things I did look at that I was interested in is sort of could we use their measurements to predict who's gonna fail? So we looked at preterm and infants and we looked at their head circumference, we looked at their size, we compared their head circumference to size. Is there something about preterm infants that they have kind of bigger heads, smaller bodies, and we're more likely to fail? And that's what we thought is kind of the larger, proportionally larger head would be more likely to fail. So we looked at um, almost 400 preterm and term low birth infants who underwent CAR-C testing, but unfortunately found no differences in the absolute measurements or ratios at all. What we did find is preterm infants um, who were multiples were more likely to fail, kind of unclear reason. And those term low birth weight infants who'd required nasal cannula at any point or had poor prenatal care were more likely to fail. Um, what we really wanted to capture more is tone. Was it the low tone kids or kids with lower high tone that were more likely to fail? But that is very poorly documented in the medical record. So it's hard for us to really tease that out. So what's missing? Really, what does a failed car seat tolerance screen really mean for the health and safety of these babies? And really the answer is we're not sure. We're not sure. What we do know is at the time, if they're failing their car seat test, they're not breathing effectively in the car seat. That could be for a variety of different reasons. Maybe they're not properly positioned. Maybe the car seat's the wrong size, or maybe they have some underlying medical condition that's causing this. So there's really limited data on longer term outcomes in infants. Is this a marker of immaturity? Do they need closer monitoring? Are they at increased risk of SIDS or sudden unexplained infant death? We're not sure. There's no studies that tie car seat testing and SIDS. So that'd be something really important for future research that people are working on. But we do have some studies that look at a little bit longer term data to give us a little bit of information. So one of the studies, it came out in 2016, and this is a group who, if a baby fails their car seat tolerance screen from the newborn nursery, um, they are automatically admitted to the NICU for a period of observation on the monitor. 
for 24 to 48 hours. So that's pretty conservative. I'd say very few places do this, but this gives us the opportunity to look at these babies and say, hey, what do they look like afterwards? And what they found is almost 40% were identified to have persistent apnea once they got to the NICU. And they had other comorbidities of immaturity, <clears throat> low blood sugars, um, they were cold, some of them needed additional nutritional support. So they didn't have longer post-discharge follow-up, but at least a substantial number of those kids were having breathing difficulties after the car seat test once they got to the NICU. They didn't differentiate if this was central apnea or obstructive apnea, but they were showing some abnormal signs. <clears throat> A study that I did with um, one of my residents and fellows looked at exclusive nursery admissions of late preterm infants. And of those kids who failed from the nursery, 20, over 20% 20 required NICU transfer for persistent vital sign abnormalities noted only because they underwent the CURSI test. And two thirds of those had such persistent hypoxia that they had to go home and home oxygen. So these kids that are failing, especially failing multiple times, often have some um, underlying breathing pathology that needs to be further investigated. We looked at sleep studies in kids. So one of the studies we did in Maryland was looking at kids who underwent a sleep study and also had failed CAR-C tests. We compared those who failed one test to those who failed two or more tests. And we found that those babies who failed two or more tests had much more abnormal arousal ind indexes um, and a trend towards more abnormal hypopnea indexes, meaning kind of periodic breathing and slowed breathing and more ab abnormal obstructive apnea indexes are more likely to occlude their airway. So it's important to know these kids who are failing two or more times, be, con be more concerned about those kids. You definitely want to reevaluate them in the car seat, make sure the position is appropriate, but they might have some underlying pathology that needs to be further worked up. With the study, one of the studies that looked at the longest term follow-up was a study by Jensen from CHOP that evaluated um, thousands of babies who underwent a car seat tolerance screen and compared those who failed versus those who passed when it came to re being readmitted at 30 days of life or mortality at 30 days of life. And what they found was those kids who failed a car seat tolerance screen had a longer length of stay, but were a lower adjusted odds of 30 day readmission. So basically they stayed longer, but were less likely to be readmitted within the first month. So whether that means the failure of this test un unnecessarily prolongs hospitalization, keep them in the house, hospital longer, or actually results in appropriate post-test care that then avoids an adverse outcome is not clear. But it did seem to indicate that even though these kids might stay longer initially, we were able to do something, identify something that kept them safe and prevented them from being readmitted in the future. A study I did um, in Maryland was to look at kids who failed their car seat test and look at similar kids who passed. So for every kid who failed, we looked at one who passed who had the same sex, same gestational age, and very similar birth weight. And what we found was those kids who failed had more likely, um, uh, were more likely to have developmental issues, tone issues, seizure disorders um, than those who passed, although it was a small number and it wasn't statistically significant. What was statistically significant was the breathing issues. So those kids who failed were more likely than their matched controls who passed to have asthma, to be treated with asthma meds, and to have obstructive sleep apnea. So again, kind of indicating some of these kids who fail have some underlying pathology. So what do we know? We're starting to have some increased data on incidence of failure, risk factors during their admission, and immediate follow-up of failed car seat tolerance screens, as I presented. But what's still lacking is really, as we talked about guidelines for failure criteria from the AAP, the answer to the question, does this improve care for our neonates? And longer term follow-up of things like breweries or brief resolved unexplained events, formerly called ULFIs, ED visits and urgent care visits and admissions related to car seat testing and breathing, and sudden unexplained infant death and SIDS. And what we're trying to avoid is this, right? This story, the newborn left foaming at the mouth and stopped breathing when she suffered oxygen deprivation after her car seat. We're really trying to keep our kids safe and prevent stories like this from happening. So what's the data on sudden unexplained infant death and car seat positioning? Again, there's been no studies that compared car seat testing to sudden unexplained infant death, but there have been studies looking at car seat positioning and this unfortunate outcome. So infants, infant deaths in the sitting device, the majority of the time it occurs in a car seat. So those who are dying in a sitting device, the majority are sitting in their car seat. And in these cases, fewer than 10% were being used as directed and more than half of the deaths occurred when the child is in their car seat at their own home. So this is really important to know this information to be able to guide our families properly and to be able to position them properly in the car seat. 
And at the time of uh, nursery discharge, a recent study showed that 86% of families made an error in infant positioning in the car seat. And this is healthy kids in the nursery. So I think this is, again, is so important for people to get more information on proper positioning of infants, especially high-risk infants. So what does a car seat tolerance failure mean? Again, we're not sure. We've got some ideas, but more questions and answers. But it's important to know what a pass means for that matter. So what is a, are we sure a pass is safe? So when we look at the test retest reliability or how frequently we can kind of do this test and get the same results, most NICUs and nurseries perform one car seat tolerance screen on their preterm infants, usually within a couple of days of anticipated discharge. If they fail, the next steps in the evaluation really vary. Some places continue admission and retest, some places admit to the NICU if they're already in the nursery or a higher level of care, some places retest in the car bed. But no matter what we do, we do something. We evaluate them, we keep them longer, we retest them, we notice when they fail. If they pass, we think, great, they're safe, they're, they can be discharged, we move home. But it's unclear what an isolated failure or an isolated pass of this test means for the safety of our neonate. Does a pass mean they're safe? So what's the data? So Michelle de Grazia and her group in 2007 published a study where they performed two car seat tolerance screens, testing, a time of recovery, and a repeat test, and found that 8% of subjects who passed a first test failed a second test. My group on, um, with uh, Larry Ryan performed a repeat a similar test um, in 2014, where we actually performed three. So we took it one step further. We performed three car seat tolerance screens about 24 to 48 hours apart in the NICU. And we found 11% of those kids who passed an initial test went on to fail either their second or third test. So it's kind of concerning. We can feel relatively reassured that about 90% of those who pass will go on to pass future tests, but there are about 10% of kids who pass and go on to fail. Um, so it's important, again, to educate families to really minimize time in this position and really important to educate families how to properly position because these were um, NICU nurses placing babies in the car seat, not families. So your patient fails their car seat tolerance screen. What's the next step? And I think this is the, the biggest problem for all of us. What do we do next? And there's not great data, but kind of building on what we know. So our options really are to retest in a car seat after a period of observation or to test in a car bed and discharge in a car bed. That's assuming these babies are safe, otherwise evaluated, otherwise doing well. Um, it's important to note the current AAP um, uh, statement doesn't specify retesting. They say, you know, period of observation, consider oxygen or whatever you need to do to keep the baby safe. But repeating a car seat test isn't really um, specifically stated by the AAP. So we were curious to sort of see what people do. So what, what's going on? So the survey I did of NICUs in 2020 found that 86.5% of um, level two, three, and four NICUs surveyed do repeat a car seat tolerance screen. 4.7% would automatically discharge in a car bed after one failed test, and about 9% either weren't sure, unknown, or had a variety of different options. But the vast majority will at least attempt repeating one time. So um, when to repeat the test is often a question I get. So if a baby fails and we're planning on repeating, when do you repeat the test? And you can see based on the survey results that it, quite a wide range. It ranges from within 12 hours to 24 to 48 hours to three or more days to provider discretion. So what's tough is the range is quite, quite a wide range. Um, so more neat research needs to be done on this to really get a better idea of what's gonna be safe for these babies. Um, so right now, you know, if they fail their car seat test, assess for fit of the infant in the car seat and appropriateness of positioning. If you have child passenger safety tech or you are a child passenger safety tech, getting that child passenger safety team involved early on to assess for fit. Update the family, keep them posted on what's going on. The worst thing is a surprise to the family, like, oh, we did this test, we didn't really tell you about it, your baby failed, we're not sure what to do next. That's the worst, so really informing the family is important. What I recommend in the nursery, and I know it's a lot of NICU people, but kind of the, the nursery babies um, who are not already on a pulse ox, I recommend in our unit keeping them on the pulse ox for 60 minutes after failed test. Give or take, it depends on whether they're feeding, how they're doing, but often you'll see if they fail their car seat test, if they're having persistent desaturations or bradycardia, they really need a further workup. If they're not already in the NICU, thinking about the NICU, if they are in the NICU, thinking about further medical evaluation, because that means they're still having problems while supine. Um, if they have no desaturations and have stable vitals, that's when I think of, you know, that they're doing okay, but maybe we need to repeat the test. I usually recommend waiting 24 hours in the NICU, ideally at least 12 to 24 hours from the failed test, 
giving them time to recover, giving them an additional day of respiratory maturity and improved tone. And again, really involving that child passenger safety team if you have the luxury of having one and everyone really should have a child passenger safety team. Um, but waiting, again, my recommendation is usually 24 hours. What if they fail a second test? What, are we, what do we do then? Well, what are hospitals doing? So in our survey of NICUs, we found that the vast majority are repeating a car seat test and it really ranges. We asked two, three, four, or no maximum. And to give you a better sense, we've got a little pie chart here. So we found 62% will allow two repeat tests really until further intervention is done. Um, another quarter will do three tests, 3% will do four tests, and about 10% will just repeat it until they pass. So teams are really trying to avoid car beds. Um, but again, the data I showed, once they're failing two or more times, they have more abnormal sleep studies, they have more abnormal findings. So if they're failing multiple tests, it's really important to, to think about a, a further medical workup before just repeating unlimited tests. So again, you're gonna assess for fit, you're gonna make sure they're appropriately positioned, you're gonna keep the family updated. But if they fail the second test, I, I really consider subspecialty consultation at this point or further medical issue. Is there something else going on? Do they need axiometry study? Do they need a sleep study? It's not something we routinely do, um, but it makes us concerned. Is this kid who needs oxygen? Are they continuing to deset? So really keeping a closer eye on those kids. Um, after, after a second fail of the car seat tolerance screen is the soonest I would consider a car bed, but if you're considering a car bed, you must test in the car bed. Um, you must repeat this test, and here's why. So the one study that came out in 2007 that really looked at car beds versus car seats um, in preterm infants, they studied VLBW infants born less than 1,500 grams who were preterm, so they kind of focused on the micropremies. But they did a crossover study where an infant started out in the car seat, underwent the car seat test, had a period of recovery, and then underwent a car bed test. The other half underwent a car bed test, period of recovery, underwent a car seat test. They were randomly assigned to one, then the other. So you had a really good comparison. They were basically being compared to themselves. What they found was in the car seat, 15% had, had an event, one needed the test to be stopped, and the time to the first event averaged 55 minutes. In the car bed, 19% had an event, one needed the test to be stopped, and the time to the first event averaged about 54 minutes. About 28% had some sort of event in both. The same number had events after 60 and after 90 minutes, and the same number needed nursing intervention. So this tells you that these kids, again, have breathing issues in these different positions. And the car bed is not the automatic go-to for a failed car seat test. It can be a safe way for babies to go home. It can be a safe breathing, you know, way for babies to breathe on their way home. But I don't recommend it as an automatic if kids fail the car seat. And this emphasizes why if they fail their car seat test, or I'm sorry, if they fail their car seat test and they're going home in a car bed, you must perform a similar car bed test where you're monitoring them before they go home because they're often just as likely to have events in this position. And when we ask hospitals what they're doing, um, if they do send kids home in a car bed, are they performing a car bed test? 79% said they were, but unfortunately about 20% either said no or it's up to the provider. And that's extremely concerning for, because of the reasons I just showed. So with car beds, I do attempt to avoid them. They are a safe mode of transportation, but they are more cumbersome for families. A lot of times the NICU will try to send a kid in a car bed just because they're small or too small for a car seat, but most of the car beds aren't approved down to smaller kids. So unless they absolutely medically need to go in a car bed, um, I try to avoid it and keep them in a car seat. If they can't be safely discharged in a car seat, then you must perform a car bed tolerance screen to assess respiratory status. And at that point, it's really important to know how are you gonna get the kid back in a car seat? Um, if they fail the car seat test, it's really important to repeat a car seat test in the future to safely transition them. How are we gonna do that? Does your hospital or um, your hospital or a local hospital offer repeat testing? Does the pediatricians offer repeat testing? Very frequently they don't. Um, they don't have the staff, they don't have the time, they don't have the facilities to do that. So we ask these NICUs as well, who are sending kids in car beds, what follow-up are they providing? And vast majority, 71%, just discharge them in a car bed and send them to their primary care provider. And that's really not fair to the family or to the primary care provider. Um, we did have some that had a clinic appointment or had a ability to return to the hospital for repeat testing. This was before COVID, so I wonder how many of these um, no longer allow this to have babies come back into the hospital. Um, a few of them had a pulmonary appointment or a few of them said either PCP or pulmonary appointment, but the vast majority just kind of sent them to their pediatrician. So it's important when you're getting ready to send these babies home, if they're going home in a car bed, you need to help facilitate them coming back. One option locally 
um, if your hospital doesn't provide this is Mount Washington. So Mount Washington, um, it offers an opportunity to have outpatient repeat car seat tolerance screening in those who went home in a car bed. Um, more information to follow in the educational sessions. I think they're gonna speak to, to that a little bit more, but we do locally have an ability to repeat this if we do send them home in a car bed. Um, and it's ideally, I recommend securing a location for retesting at either 44 weeks postmenstrual or corrected age or one month of age, whichever is later. That's gonna give them a period of time of maturity, of breathing maturity, of tone maturity, um, and then repeating the test up to maximize success. So ultimately when it comes to counseling families, you know, there's, there's a lot we know, there's a lot more we don't know. Um, there's a lot of ongoing research by myself and others across the nation to try to get more information for all of us to get our babies home safely, but there are a few things we can 100% say for sure. One is we really need to minimize time in the car seat position or the semi-upright position. That means car seats, that means bouncy chairs, slings, swings. We shouldn't leave babies sleeping in the semi-upright position. It's so tempting because they're comfortable, but again, the data shows that if <clears throat> babies who die in this position are frequently in their car seat, they're frequently left in their car seat at home, and they're frequently poorly positioned. So no baby should be left snoozing in their car seat when they get back. They should be directly observed during travel and taken out of their car seat after travel. And we know to do close observation while in the car seat. So someone to keep an eye on them because we know even if they pass their car seat test, data shows that doesn't guarantee every single time they're safe. So it shows they can be safe, but 10% of kids eventually went on to have a failed car seat test. So it's important to have someone directly staring at this baby, um, especially the first month of life, especially while they're kind of improving their neck and head control and ability to clear their airway. Try to take frequent breaks on long periods of travel. I tend to do a maximum two hour of continuous travel before a break. We have families all over the state traveling. They have long drives to home. But I say, hey, max it at one and a half, absolutely two hours. Get the baby out, change their diaper. Just give them a position change, feed them before you put them back in the car seat. So a lot that's unknown, but at least these things we can take that seem like really safe recommendations for our families. And why that's important is we did a study that looked at families who pass versus fail that I talked about before. And we called the families and we asked them after they went home, how long are they spending in their car seat? Um, whether, and we thought maybe those kids that failed would be less likely to spend time in the car seat because the parents were more scared or the babies that passed would be less likely to spend more time in the car seat because the parents got more information. We weren't sure, but what we found was whether they passed or failed, about a third um, did spend a short amount of time in their car seat a day. This is non-travel time. About another third or so spent 30 to 50 minutes of non-travel time in their car seat a day. But about 40% of kids, whether they passed or failed, it wasn't different, spent an hour or more of non-travel time in their car seat, usually sleeping per day. So whether or not they fail their car seat test or pass it, we really need to get more education to our families about how this is a very risky position to be in. So a lot of questions, but a lot of answers that we can use to inform our families. So thank you so much um, for the opportunity to talk about this, talk about my passion. Um, I'm happy to take any questions uh, via email. Um, please reach out. And um, if anyone has any further research ideas, questions, you know, thoughts, please share them because I want to kind of build a community that works on this together. Thank you, Dr. Davis. That was wonderful as always. Lots to think about. A quick reminder to listeners, if you are accepted for the in-person workshop on April 26, before then, make sure you have listened to the other prerequisite webinar and taken its quiz in order to have the background information as well as to get the CEU. Or if you're not attending the April 26 workshop, um, you still can get credit for listening to these this webinar if you answer the quiz and send that back. And I will follow up later to get you your proof of um, having listened to the workshop and passed the quiz. Any questions on child passenger safety, the continuing education credit for this webinar, any child passenger safety resources or the car seat tolerance screen, including any questions for Dr. Davis, please contact me at cps at mims.org or you can call me at 410-706-8647. Thank you so much.